looking forward to this evening's presentation. And I will ask our Vice President, Ken Porter, to introduce our speaker this evening. Okay. Ari Huxema is from Edmonton, but we won't hold that against him. Ari has been involved in the antique dealing world for over 48 years and has an insatiable interest in the alta, in alta glass animals. I heard from a little alta glass bird that Ari is interested in writing a book on alta glass regarding the oddities and idiosyncrasies of the glass. Please help me welcome this evening's speaker, Ari Huxema. not too far from here. So it was nice to see you, Graham. But I can relate, and at that time, Graham said to me, when did you start collecting? I said, I've always been collecting, buying and selling. So I've always been buying and selling. That's just the way I am. I happen to be of Dutch background. Now, you know, Fort McLeod is full of Indians, Hutterites, and Dutchmen. So you've got that all figured out now. So, and it's a poke and plum town. You folks never been there. You poke your head out of town, and you, and you poke your head out of the window, you're plum out of town. So keep that in mind. So I started collecting anything and everything, and I never really cared about what I collected. I just wanted to find something. I ran across some alta glass pieces, and I thought, oh, no big deal. They're made in medicine hat. So then I researched why it was there so much stuff made in medicine hat. And people will tell you, well, it's the right kind of clay. It's the right kind of silicon for the glass. It's the right kind of this, it's the right kind of that. No, that's not the answer. The reason for it is, the reason is very simple. Cheap gas. Until recently, the people in medicine hat didn't even pay for the, their, gas, their homes to be fired up. And if you do your history, in, in 1903, Rudyard Kipling, came to Medicine Hat. He stayed at the Cinnaboy Hotel. Anybody know the Cinnaboy Hotel? It's right downtown. I think it's closed up now. It's locked up. There's boards on it. They'll try to they'll make a historical site out of it. But I was, a fascin I was fascinated by the writings of Rudyard Kipling, so I decided to study about Kipling, and I found out he stayed in Medicine Hat, so I wanted to sleep in the same room that Rudyard Kipling stayed in. So he stayed in Medicine Hat in 1903, and he claimed Medicine Hat is all hell for a basement because of the gas fines, and that's uh, why the it, Medicine Hat started the way it is. Now, there's so many ways to start with this, so I will start very, very simple with the man that started Elder Glass. So Elder Glass has been around since 1950 it started. Czechoslovakian fellow in the late 30s. He saw a guy called Hitler getting wound up. He says, I kind of don't like the way this man thinks. I want to get out of Czechoslovakia. He ends up in England. Falls in love with a lady, and they work in a glass factory. Decide to get out of England after the war and go to Canada. <laughs> Similar to the story of my folks. Okay, so now they get to Canada, they go to Ontario, and they find out the price of gas is exorbitant. Someone says, go to Medicine Hat. He shows up with his wife, his daughter, or Margaret, and a son-in-law, and no money. 
Medeltas at that time has the big clay ovens which you've seen. Medeltas is very, very good to them and lend him, allow him to use part of the machinery and he starts blowing glass. His very first product that he starts making are buttons. And you can still find them now. They're on cards. You can even find them on cards. Little glass buttons. So we're talking 1950. And at that point in time, he becomes fascinated by animals. And if you remember, now speed up with me. Now we're going to the 1950s. If you remember, everybody in 1950, early 60s, you had a big hunk of glass in the center of your coffee table. That was style. Okay? So with that in mind, he started making large pieces of glass. Incidentally, all that glass there is for sale, ladies and gentlemen. I brought some of these books that Derek and Ann McNanny wrote, and you can get these, you can have these books for the same money that I paid for them. I brought some in case you want them. It gives you a history and it tells you the history of the factory. So from 1950 to 1984, approximately. So now let's get started. He starts making swans, and he starts making different types of swans. And if you have to say what is the gradient variance of all the animals he makes, it was swans. There's swans that start out like this. Okay? Then he takes the swans and he makes this all one piece. Then he takes a piece of glass, he stretches this, and this is the most biggest common one, you know. He stretches this bigger, puts a big loop on it, and he makes a swan out of these. Now these we, but he had to think of ways to make money. So there was a little company, you might have heard it, called Sin Crude. <laughs> so Sin Crude made, he had, he made these little candy dishes for Sin Crude. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, he was always trying to think of something to sell. And at the same time this was happening, the Canadian government, a glass bore would come to Canada from Spain, Italy, Holland, all your different Hungary, several came in from Hungary. So where do these guys, where do you think they were sent? Go to Medicine Hat. So now you Medicine Hat, he's got, and he can't afford to keep all these guys. So they work there for six months, eight months, 10 months, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years, until they learn, start learning the language, and then they start to dissipate into the culture of Canada. But in the meantime, what do they do? They make beautiful things. So this is kind of the unique thing about Alvilas. So I took one very, very small facet of Alta Glass, and that is the animals. Now I don't know, I started with animals, and I thought, okay, I should get this collection put together. I, I was influenced by McNanny's book, and before you know it, I started buying more and more and more. So now I've got over 2,000. So now people are saying, okay, when are you going to write a book? Well, I'm going to write a book. But you see, every time I turn around, then we have a fellow called Ken Porter, and so now ask me if he's got a couple of pieces I don't have. And I and he does. You see what I mean? So for example, he has a pelican here that I don't have. So the variance of them is unbelievable. As a result, you could have two pieces that were exactly basically made the same, but because they were handmade, they look different. Okay? So rule of thumb, if the beak is open, it's a duck. The beak is closed, it's a goose. <laughs> so you have to, and they had many, many ways of marketing. So they had kids come in, and then you know, the kids had nothing to do, they just put stickers on things. So you can have a piece of alto glass, and this is the neat thing about alto glass. It has, it is signed as many as two or three, four times. Now the earliest sticker, and that's why I brought this piece, the earliest sticker, is a round sticker. Okay, the earliest sticker. Now they made they made this piece for different organizations. The Masonic Order bought a lot of these. The uh, Elks and the Moose bought a lot of them. Okay, but the round sticker is the earliest form. Then, after that period of time, they then you would find pieces that were made, and the most common sticker is the square or sometimes diamond. Okay? This kind of an unusual piece, it's a stopper. Now, keep in mind, they were always thinking of ways of making money. And you know, this gal sitting in the front row by the name of Ruth, I've been very, very fortunate over the years, and so how do I get all these things? It's because she has been a very, very big contributor. So I bought lots of pieces off Ruth, and your man in the back there was trying to shoot somebody with his gun, 
and uh, I bought a lot of things off him over the years. So this was a souvenir shop in Cold Lake. Sold this. Now somebody, if you've ever been to Saskatchewan, ever been to Saskatchewan, you guys? Anybody here from Saskatchewan? Everybody here from Alberta? Everybody here from Alberta? Okay, we won't come for Because I'll tell an Alberta joke. See, I traveled around with the carnivals and the circus and and I, before I forget, before I forget, I was going to introduce my girlfriend, but she wouldn't appreciate the devotion, so it's my daughter. I wanted you to meet my daughter, Ada. Ada, if you just stand up and take a bow, please. <laughs> Ada's a school teacher here in Calgary, so your kids are going to be all that much smarter. So, they would, one day, walking down the, and there was a little, little mom and paw operation trying to sell some things. And I see this little piece of glass bird. I know right now it's Elter glass. I look at the bottom, it says Bonnie Doon Bowling Lanes. Well, I happen to know the guys at Bonnie Doon Bowling Lanes. They've been around since about 1950. I said, where'd you get these pieces? He said, oh, no, the Elter glass guy came and sold us, said, you need some different kind of bowling prizes? So they sold us Elter glass pieces. Uh, one of the pieces that I got from Ruth, as I mentioned, Here's a little piece I bought from Ruth many years ago. Not that long ago, right, Ruth? Okay, don't say anything. Manitou Beach, Saskatchewan. Okay. All right. So, is everybody here from Alberta? Are most people here from Alberta? Okay, I'll tell an Alberta joke. Now, this is the oldest Alberta joke there is. It's a little off color, and I'm not apologizing for that. That's just the way it is. <laughs> Fellow comes out of highway number 14, going out of Edmonton. Gets into a serious car accident, into a state of unconsciousness. He finally wakes up and he says, what happened? He said, you were knocked unconscious. And we had to do an operation. He said, well, what happened? He said, we had to amputate your toes. He said, well, where am I? He says, you're in toe field. He says, oh, thank goodness I wasn't in Balzac or Cochran. <laughs> oh, you guys get it? <laughs> oh, I know, it's sad. <laughs> but you'll be repeating it tomorrow. Stags, they're the son-in-law of the man who started, and they have a son who becomes an engineer who passed away approximately two, three years ago. And he makes very unusual pieces. Not interested in the business on that's how they got such a big collection down there in Medicine Hat. And they've had three or four auctions since. And this is one of the pieces that I bought at the auction. So naturally, people say, Well, what is the rarest thing you have? The rarest, everybody wants beavers. Okay, because we're Canadian. The milk glasses are popular. But if I had to pick one piece that was super rare, and I challenge you on this now, see if you can find pink. Because Margaret Stagg, this was her favorite color and she didn't want this color out. So to find a, a pink piece of Elta glass is very, very hard to find. Not a big deal, okay? Dinosaurs, they said they never made pigs, we found pigs. This is interesting. I can't tell you, I must have now close to 15 Christmas trees. This is an example of one of them. They made all different kinds of Christmas trees. As I started doing this, I realized we got some different type of things. I found out they did wedding pieces. So I've got a couple of these. So a couple gets married. Okay, rather interesting. Then, for the good Catholics out there, we made Madonna. Notice the controlled bubbles, okay? Now, if you have some Elta El El glass pieces, I'll show you a little simple way to watch this. You just take a light, I've got it over here set up, and you just, you'll get the idea. So it, the, you see what it does with the control bubbles, okay? Now you can take it one step further, and they made a lot of miniature pieces too. They made a lot of little miniature pieces. So, and the, if you see the white in here, they tried to make it look like it was hair. That was the idea. So there's the Madonna. Now you get the same idea. 
with a young polar bear. Okay. So there's a little something. And as I kept studying about elbow glass, it just became more and more complicated. And, it's, and the reason for it is it's very, very simple. You had all these different craftsmen come in, work, and then leave. Here's another wedding piece. Okay? I have a double set of red. So people ask, what's, what's the rarest color? Red. I was talking to somebody here this afternoon. Uh, red paint. You want to get your car painted, you want to get your best bang for your buck, get a red paint. Red paint is the most expensive paint. Red color is the same thing with glass. And how you got the red is usually with the gold. And if you know any of you antique collectors, you can't take cranberry glass and leave it in a window. Because if you do, you're going to take the male piece and turn it into a female piece. Okay? Now, here's an, two elephants. Can you see that? Okay. So now, how many pieces of wedding pieces are there? I don't know. And then you find oddball things like sailboats. And they have many, there's four different types of stickers. So there's the little centennial ones. There's the centennial, in 1967, they decided to make a sticker recognizing Canada's centennial. That was the big sticker. This is the little sticker. Well, 1967 went by the wayside, but they still had lots of stickers, so they just continued. They had to be careful with this, not to do any infringements with Disney. This is the Disney duck. You then what was you'll find unusual pieces that were made the, what they call lunchbox pieces. And that means the guys would talk at lunchtime and say, well, what are you doing? What are you making? And at that point in time they would challenge each other, make something unusual. Many, many people I've talked to went to Medicine Hat, went through the factory, wiggled through the lines, and as you got toward the end of the line after observing everything, They'd say, well, what do you want? And that's how they'd make money. You have to, this factory had a very, very humble existence. So as a result, if you wanted a horse, possibly, this is, I'm only guessing, but it's going to be a pretty strong, because I got a couple of pieces like this. They took some beer bottles, melted the beer bottles, and then made a horse. But can you see the quality? Can you see the... Now, have any of you ever taken the time to try to figure out how glass blowing is done? It's an extremely, extremely complicated scenario. I am told now, and I'm only saying this so you can check me out, Murano is now apparently out of business. I know it's a whole bunch of glass blowers on the island of Murano, I get all that. But I was in Winters approximately six months ago, and the Winters had a third of the store full of glass. So I said, what happened here? Where did you guys get all the glass? And they said, oh, it's, Moran it's a clear out from Moran. So the uh, Asian market has beat that one up. Here's a, an unusual piece. It's an alligator, crocodile, whatever you want to call it. Okay. You don't see these very often. And where I found these, where I found the one only pieces, I had to run across people. I had to run across people who had been through the factory or had been in a situation where they got it as a gift or as a promotion. They did graduation presents and they made unusual pieces for graduations. They did a lot of, uh, you know, you have a, what do you call it when a bunch of people get together for a party? Uh, shrines do it all the time. Convention, thank you. I have a tough And convention, they made a lot of different pieces for different conventions. So this is the variants that there are out there. Now, in the book, they made their own, they made a simple little catalog, and it's all listed in there. They made, they made pieces, and I bought a lot of pieces in the United States, whether you believe it or not. Some of the nicest pieces I bought, I bought them in uh, Seattle, Great Falls. And if you go on the internet, and you Google it, the Alpha Glass, you'll find pieces in the United States. Bing Crosby, there's a, quite a story here about Bing Crosby, how he uh, was given gifts from the provincial government for entertaining, and how one of the Swan's broke and he wanted it replaced, so they replaced it for him. So it was a little, little humble story out of Madison Hat. What's, when am I going to write the book? I don't know. Now, you'll see this form very, now I'm going to share some forms that are not 
you'll see this very, very common. Okay, very, very common. This is made by the White Friars in England, okay? I bought about six or seven of these before I started finding out. You know. Continental, some guys worked in Medicine Hat, and then they came up to Calgary, and they started Continental. Quite easy to recognize them, actually. And there's the form, and I don't see eyes on Continentals. In most cases, you see eyes. Then you have other pieces where the, I have three pieces here where the jury's out. I bought this this weekend for this gentleman in the row. I have to do my research on it. Do I think it's, do I think it's Alta glass? There's a strong possibility it has everything going for it. It has the red, it has the eyes, it has the crimping, it's very similar crimping. It has the same uh, crimping on the, uh, on, the, on the top part. So I will do more research on, on that. The other one is, I bought a large collection right here in, in Calgary, matter of fact, I bought about 50 pieces from this one family. And uh, this is the only, everything was good, except this one piece, and I'm showing it to you folks, because it has, you don't, I don't see gold flecks in alpha glass. And yet this one has it, it's properly signed, it has the proper base. So now I don't know, was alpha glass, were they running out of ideas, or are they looking for, were they looking for different ideas? And that would be very, very logical. You can find Murano pieces that are almost identical to Alta Glass and vice versa. Okay? Then there's this one. Everything's right. If it didn't have this beak on it, this has the proper base, proper color, the teal, Caribbean blue, but it's got a perfectly shamed little fish in the beaks. So now I just wait a minute. I don't think there's any of that. And it's not marked. So this is one I'll have to check out to give you an idea. Okay? But other than that, the beautiful part brought that by Alta Glass, the majority of the pieces are marked. Now, I was talking to a couple of people that, that they bought, they got pieces and they didn't like the stickers on them, so they took the stickers off. So, it, was, it happens. So, any questions? You know, uh, let's talk, let's talk Alta Glass. Alta Glass probably made as many as 10 different styles of swans. 10 different styles. So you have, you can take this, crimp it tight, crimp this tight, and then take this neck, put the neck on the end, and you've got one of the styles that they made. And they made it in different sizes. Uh, made it in milk glass, they made it. And you, you'll see that particular swan without the wings, just like that. And uh, also in different sizes. Now every batch of glass was made daily. So now, sometimes if you let a piece, and, the, and their big claim to fame was the control bubble. As you can see, they like to put it. Now if you go to the museum down there in Medicine Hat, I can't probably, it's E-S-C, I forget the word. It's on that, that's the name of the museum. But you go in there and they have some of the tools that were used by <coughs> the glass. And one of them was the control bubbles that they were quite proud about. Barry, are there other pieces that you're looking for that you know are in existence that you haven't got in your collection? I have no idea. So you say, what am I looking for? Well, if Ken, not, if Ken turns, his, turns his head, or if he gets weak, uh, well, I'd be prepared to give him a, a healthy profit on this piece of pelican. But you know, I respect, I respect that he's collecting that too. Uh, I'm running ads now in different uh, magazines wanting to buy collections. So will, will I see pieces that I have never seen before? I will, but you know how many kinds of horses there are. So that's only one kind of horse. You can come to my home and I probably have uh, six, seven different kinds of horses in different colors, different shapes, different positions, you know. So it's, it's endless. See, that's why it's almost endless because everything is handmade. Handmade and in a different batch of glass every day. So I mean, where are we going to where are we going to stop here? So I'm at I'm at the count of 2,000, and everybody's just saying, "Hurry up, write the book." Well, there's still more to it. There's still more to it. They're all handmade. 
So you can have two swans that are the same size. So then take a caliber and start measuring them, and they'll be different. Maybe the head is like take. So the most common is the most variance is swans. The most common is probably geese. Are you ready for the second most common? Pelicans. Man, they punched out a lot of pelicans. So I must have, uh, well, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 pelicans alone. No, not, not, not pelicans, um, penguins. Penguins. Who's your agree? Lots of penguins. And what's nice about the penguins, they put a lot of effort into different colors in the penguins. That's kind of the neat thing about penguins. You have really lots of different colors in the penguins. Yeah, so penguins, and then of course they made a lot of uh, ducks, and then I call them snowbirds. So you would be exposed here. These are, these are snowbirds. Okay, cute, eh? Made lots of snowbirds. So I, uh, I have to, and there's, there's another thing where I have to do my homework. I've got a, but you know, I have uh, seahorses. Like who would ever believe you find a seahorse? Well, now I have three of them, you know. There's, there, so where, where does it stop? I don't know. Uh, not many people have seen alligators, you know. Dinosaur, that's the only dinosaur piece I've ever seen. Now, take a look. I found this about a month ago. Little stopper, little wine stopper. Gives you an idea. Yeah. So what happened is you were wandering through, and I've met many people that this has happened to, you were wandering through the factory, and you got to the end, and they say, or at the beginning of the factory, and say, what do you want? And then they would make something for you by the time you finished your little tour. And it was a, it was a, a stream of income for them. So what did happen to the company uh, the National Energy Program. That's what they blame us on. But on the other side of the coin, they had so much inventory, it was unbelievable. They didn't have enough salespeople knocking on doors. So uh, that's why if you go down to Medicine Hat and you see the, uh, the Medelta, there's a, select, there's a section there of Alta Glass, and they're uh, getting that set up. And now I understand since uh, their son passed away that he apparently has a collection, some, some large collections. So there'll be some more collections come on the market. How can you tell an glass fish from a normal fish? Uh, very, very, the simplest way to do it is the, uh, once you get to understand, one, buy 10 pieces, buy 10 pieces, and after a while you, you know. Now, take for example, Give you a simple example. Morano never did this. You know that, and I know that. And be careful with fish. You wouldn't believe how many have just broken and cracked, but you have to be really careful. And they're very, very thin. But I understand it's something about the mouth. You know, yeah, their mouth is open and all this kind of stuff. But no, I have, I have them really close. It depends, you know, how they crimped it just before. Uh, the biggest, uh, biggest fish I have is probably about this big. You know, they've got some. But if you go down to the uh, Medelta collection there, uh, you'll see some very, very large examples of it. Yeah. But uh, then people will say to you, "Well, you can tell the Alta glass by feeling it." Really? Uh, <laughs> you know, so I can tell you one thing. You know, people say, "Well, it's got to have that greasy feel." Well, I'll show you 30, 40 pieces that don't have a greasy feel. You know, so. You have to understand that every batch is different. Now, what happened with some of the other glass, you had a cratering on. I'll just show you over here what I mean by that. But I bought a, a very extreme example. This is an alto glass piece. It was, this was beautiful, 1955. And as you can see, it, the outside edge of the glass, flaked off and became rough. Okay, but what's really unusual, the inside, where it wasn't exposed to the sunlight, is still smooth. So the sunlight did this. Yeah. And that's not entirely true because I have other pieces where I've got swirls in the glass and not necessarily the entire piece, just maybe a streak through the center of the, of the animal where you get a little bit of cratering of the outside layer. But it's a handmade piece, so you have these 
you have these scenarios. Did they make a lot of vases? Yes, vases, a lot of vases, mm -hmm. a lot of vases. Now, uh, just for fun there, you see the top of that high vase there? And then you see that one? Okay, good. And then there's a charger in front of it. And then we have one of your members here brought two more pieces. See, you see the, you see the pieces, how they all look the same? With that in mind, okay, now watch. It was stylish to smoke cigarettes in the 40s, in the 50s, okay? So we don't, we don't, we really don't care too much about turtles. So now what do we got? We got an ashtray. So they, they made pieces, these are kind of hard to find. Pieces that were ashtrays, and if you didn't smoke, you turn it on, and there were turtles. <laughs> So, uh, I have about, uh, well, I don't know, four or five of these. These are kind of kind of tough to, see, remember I told you the same, we're looking at the same of that little fish. Here's the same type on his under, uh, under his throat, the same type of forming of the glass. As, and this is what I have to do. I have to find other pieces where I could actually match them exactly so that I know what I have. So I continue to do that. And uh, red being what it is, it's collectible. Anybody else? What was your source of the glass? You said the uh, horse was recycled beer bottles. Yeah, uh, no, they bought, it's in this book. They bought glass, the basis of most glass is silicon, you know. And technically, I don't know if you know this or not, this is kind of an unusual trivia question. Glass is technically a liquid. So if you go to an old farmhouse and you measure with a caliper at the very top of the window, you measure that, and you measure at the very, very bottom of the window, I guarantee it, your window's like this. So glass is technically a liquid. But in this book here, it gives you the breakdown of what they used with different quantities. But don't forget, if they had a glob of glass laying it from the day before, what do they do? Just throw it back in the furnace, fire it up. And then you have pieces of glass, especially with the paperweights, you see where they're all different kinds of colors. You know. Yeah, they're different kind of colors. So they were just made do with what they had. Or like they took this and they just took the glass and then just spotted it up with little pieces on the outside to make a Christmas tree effect. It was an, and you will, you know, and then, you, then you, you say to yourself, well, what was the guy thinking when he made this little cat? I mean, look at the dainty lines to it, you know, in red, kind of neat. So uh, a gal by the name of Mary Coward, who put a collection together, she gave that to the uh, provincial archives in Edmonton. And uh, she had a, a little paper full of textbook. And she tells, I think it's very, very accurate, that they quit making red in 1972. So it, I brought some red pieces here, and if that turns your crank, then uh, I'll make it easy to sell those. Any other questions? So now, what do you think is about, what do you think is going to happen to the value of it? The value, al alpha glass is going to go up. How many things do we have manufactured? with an artistic flair in Alberta. Not too many. Now, if we all can get excited about an old cream pot, <laughs> and we can all get excited about an old pickle jar that we jump up and down and make some sauerkraut with, surely to God we can get excited about something like this. That's where I'm coming from. So what I plan to do is write a book on it. When I don't know, when I'm gonna start, I don't know. Because every time I get ready to do it, now what I have found is, I found a fellow that was an expert on, on animals that used to work for the provincial government. So wouldn't it be neat if I could say that this was a particular type of bird? See, and I don't have that knowledge, so I gotta get that figured out. You know? And this is a particular type of fish. I don't have that figured out either. So these things I'll have to do. And the whole like, idea is that, that you know, 100 years from now, Somebody will say, 
oh, I'm sure glad that silly old bugger wrote a book on it, you know. It's just for information's sake. But each piece is handmade, so it's, you know, it's absolutely limitless. Limited. That's... Anything else, folks? You have a favorite piece this year? A paper what? A favorite piece? A favorite. A favorite. Uh, I'd have to say favorite. I have a peacock at home that's about this big with a fan out uh, uh, spreading with a stem holder in the back so that you could put a flower in. And, and that's kind of unique. So, uh, and I took a chance. I took a chance. Uh, like I have this in blue, and I also have this in Herford, in Herford colors, which is kind of unusual. You know? And they were made, uh, the fellow that we think made these, because I brought these over to discuss this with McNanny's, this is a fellow who set up in Mission BC, I just can't think of the name off the top of my head, and uh, Vargas, I was named Vargas, and he then made these type of pieces. What's the most expensive piece you have? Uh, I wouldn't argue, like if you showed me, I paid six hundred and fifty dollars for this. Six fifty. I had no choice. What am I, so what's the value? I, I was asked that before. What's the value? So what's the value of that bullet? I'm not here to discuss value. I just want to know if it's for sale. So if I take the guy in the end, Ken Porter, and I say to Ken, "How much you want?" and he says hundred, and if he says two hundred, he says three hundred, if he says four hundred, I'm not going to argue. I don't have it. Okay. Now here's the worst part. This is the tough position I'm in. He won't sell. <laughs> I, uh, I, ran, I ran an ad in the Discovery Magazine, and I said, want to buy collections? Two people phone me up. I'll sell my collection. Good. Love to see it. Thank you. I go down to Medicine Hat, one lady lived in Medicine Hat. I said, uh, can I come and see your collection? We've changed our mind. Yeah, so the, the, that's just, that's just, what you have to do. So I have to outlive with Ken Porter, that's okay. <laughs> then the executor of his estate say, get rid of it. There's a lady in Edmonton. Uh, you maybe know her. Her last name is Smith. That's her real name. And uh, she was down with the, all the sales down the mess and hat. And she's got a ton of this elder glass. I literally, I did the old fashioned thing. Knocked on her door. I said, what are we going to do business? Not yet. My phone ring. When are we going to do a business? Not yet. So, so it's, the price is, you know, what's the price? It's what's, you know, you know this in the antique business. You have who is whatever someone's prepared to pay at that exact moment in time. That's the price. So, thank you very much.